Thomas Hilland Eriksson is a writer and professor of social anthropology at the University of Oslo. In his career, Thomas published popular books, textbooks, polemical books, and various essays on topics such as identity politics, ethnicity, nationalism, and globalization. For instance, we can recommend his recent ERC-funded multi-sided project called Overheating, the three crises of globalization. Last year, at Why Do World Needs Anthropologists in Oslo, uh, when the Coalition of Anthropological Organizations delivered to you the award for the contribution to engaged anthropology, we boldly, but I think truthfully, introduced you as one of the most respected anthropologists of uh, your generation. And um, I wonder now, uh, do you feel being influential, Thomas, to start um, with? It's Yes, it's uh, it's uh, thank you very much, Pavel, and thanks for for inviting me to talk with you. Um, yes, I think I think we do have an influence, and I think I mean I have an influence in in my own small way. Uh, I at least I do my best to take part in the public in the intellectual conversation to try to enter into the public conversation some perspectives which would otherwise have been missing, and which to a great extent come from anthropology. Uh, and through the uh, global dialogue that we're having uh, about important burning issues of, of the planet, as well as the fundamental and basic and eternal questions of what it is to be a human being. So yes, I mean, we're all specks of dust in the big cosmic order. We, none of us is incredibly important, but we can still make a difference. And we have to, to keep believing that we can make a difference and that we do our best wherever we are. I think that's one of the reasons why uh, why the world needs anthropologists as a first as an event and second as a book uh, came to be that we all sort of believe we can make a difference outside of our uh, professional community. So Thomas, uh, let me start off with the first question for you. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. In your essay, uh, which actually opens and frames the book, uh, you dive into your own upbringing while sharing almost a coming-of-age story of yours. Let us start there. Uh, how did you arrive at anthropology in the first place? Well, it's, uh, thank you, Pavel. I mean, it's, uh, it's hard. Why do we become anthropologists? I think many of us become anthropologists because we don't feel 100% at home. I mean, in our own society, in our own culture, we feel slightly alienated. You know, in the first part of the 20th century, many anthropologists were women. Some were immigrants. Some of the most important ones were immigrants, or they were Jewish, or they were both immigrants and Jewish, like Franz Boas, the founder of modern uh, cultural anthropology in the United States, who was a German Jewish immigrant to, to the US. So we, uh, we are both insiders and outsiders. And in my case, well, I mean, uh, yeah, for various reasons. I, I was a kind of kid, you know, who was interested in dinosaurs and science fiction and, and spaceships and uh, that sort of thing. Uh, you know, we, we, you know, the type these types of, of children do exist in, in many parts of the world. But we also spent a couple of years in Kenya when I was a, a teenager in my early teens. My, my dad worked for the United Nations. So I was exposed to that culture, you know, and they realized that things could have been very different at home as well. And that made you think, it made you realize that at high, had I been born in a Kenyan village, I would have spoken a different language, I would have eaten different food, and maybe had different values and views on family life. And that sort of thing sets your anthropological Im imagination spinning at a very early age. The realization that not only could the world be a different place, but you could also be a very different person. As Clifford Gates, one of our other sort of founding, or, or he was a later generation than Boas, uh, said, I mean, the famous uh, American anthropologist who, who left us about a little more than a decade ago, we are all born with the ability to live a thousand different lives, but then we end up having lived only one. And one of the things that I find magic about anthropology is that it enables you to understand and maybe even to vicariously live some of those other 1,000 lives by immersing yourself in the lives of others. So we are kind of a hoarders of uh, human experience. We want to uh, get it all. It's kind of a, there's this <laughs> thirst, thirst for, um, yeah, uh, for multiplicity and uh, for, for diversity. And, yes. But maybe it makes us a little bit 
less um, what I would I would call it uh, um, tolerant to those who actually see the, the things up in an opposite opposite way, who don't really appreciate yep. the diversity, right? Yes, it's a very good point, Pavel, and it's a very important point that we should uh, find a way to deal with. Because, I mean, as, as one of my other intellectual heroes says, Ulf Hannes, who's a Swedish anthropologist, uh, you know, in order for some people to be cosmopolitans, you, you rely on some people are local. Because if there weren't any locals, you wouldn't have any cultures or societies to travel between and to compare and to study and to immerse yourself in. So there is always this dichotomy. I wrote a book many years ago in Norwegian, which would translate into English as something like roots and boots. You know, uh, some people are rooted and they're attached to the place. Other people have wings or feet or boots and they move around and, uh, and so on. Uh, in England, the, um, the English intellectual David Goodart uh, wrote a book a couple of years ago, a rather controversial book, uh, on anywheres and somewheres. He says that these are the two kinds of people now who are now competing for power. And it seems as if the anywheres have been able to, uh, to run the world a bit too long. And now the somewheres are responding against, reacting against it. And then we get new forms of politics based on identity, based on culture, based on ethnicity and so on. Uh, and uh, yeah, we should be more tolerant towards that sort of thing. And uh, as anthropologists, realizing that we represent very often a very different, a very specific kind of subject position because we base our lives and our professional identities on diversity, as you say. But mm. what about people who don't care about diversity? Mm. We should uh, realize that they also uh, um, have a place. And uh, mm. yeah, and we, we need to, you know, the cosmopolitan attitude is not that everybody should be like me, but that we should be able to understand each other in spite of the fact that we are not the same. Mm. Brilliant. Uh, I think um, I have I have a question which is one that can take uh, uh, days to answer, but I, I believe you are trying to achieve that in relatively uh, a narrow space of your essay as well, and I think you're doing it marvelously. Um, in the book, uh, one of the co-editors, Dan Podiet, recalls what you said at the stage of Why Do We Need Anthropologists in Ljubljana. In 2015 and you said that the bad news is that anthropology is never going to solve the global crises but the good news is that without us nobody is going to because our knowledge is a crucial piece of the jigsaw puzzle mm -hmm. Do you remember this statement yes 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 um, uh, I think before I before I, uh, I, I actually connect your statement with the, the question I'm, I'm coming with I think that this statement, uh, this piece of puzzle of sorts, which the discipline holds in its hands, has a lot to do with the core of your essay in the book. Mm -hmm. You present there a anthropological toolbox, so to say, which for you is about four things. Mm -hmm. Cultural relativism, ethnography, comparison, and contextual understanding. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and now I ask for something impossible. But can you briefly talk about these uh, top anthropological tools for, for our followers, our audience? Yes, uh, yes, thanks very much. Uh, yes, and we could obviously we could go on for, for weeks discussing this. But uh, I mean, just to take the conclusion first, uh, yes, anthropology has something crucial to contribute to the full understanding of the world and to the challenges that are facing us all, both at the micro level, the existential level, you know, who am I? Where am I going? What's the meaning of my life? And at the very large scale level, how are we going to solve the climate crisis and, uh, and questions to do with war and injustice and so on? And we have something to contribute. It, but we can't do it on our own. We have one piece of the jigsaw puzzle, which is crucial because we see the world from the inside and from below, and we get really close up and personal to people. It takes a long time to do ethnographic fieldwork because you have to get to know people properly. You don't just go in and ask questions and do a qualitative interview and then you go out. You sit and wait for people, you eat with them, you pay for their meal because they're often poorer than you, and, uh, and you get to know them, and you even sometimes, on a good day, you become 
friends with them. And you end up staying in touch, as I do, with some of the people from my fieldwork. You know, I did my first fieldwork in Mauritius in 1986. There are still people there I'm on Facebook with. And whenever I go to Mauritius, which I can't do this year because of COVID-19, I go and visit and we have a good chat and, and so on. So uh, we develop lifelong relationships with people. So that's, that's the way we, we develop our work. So you could say that instead of learning a little about a lot of people, we learn a lot about a few people. But that lot is quite crucial because it goes to the core of what it is to be human. And we relate it to other societies and we try to see it uh, in, in the, in, as a part of a, of a broader canvas. So in one way, anthropology is easier than physics because you don't have to learn math at the same level. But at another level, it's the most difficult thing you can do because you're never finished. You never finish the analysis. Uh, you never have an unequivocal answer to, to your questions, but you get a bit closer and you can add some depth, some color and some substance to the issues that are being raised in policy and by people who do anything from advertising to, uh, to green activism. We have something to contribute. Um, so um, you can't really distinguish which one of those tools, cultural relativism, ethnographic comparison, contextual understanding is more important. And it, it's not just one, uh, one of them. It is, they, con they, con mm -hmm. um, they compose the, the jigsaw puzzle we are talking about here. Yeah. They are yeah. seen... If, if I had to, yeah. But if I, you know, some, some anthropologists will say that, you know, just as in real estate, there are three things that matter, location, location, and location. And in anthropology, the three things that matter are context, context, and context. I would rather say that, you know, if I were to have to choose one or two, I'd say ethnography and comparison. You know, ethnography, you go deeply into some life world uh, and you stay there long enough that you really understand what people are, are up to and you relate that to other societies. So if you want to understand your own country, as I tell students who are doing feed work in Norway, if you really want to understand Norway anthropologically, you have to try to see it from the viewpoint of the Trobian Islands and see what it looks like from there. You don't have to go to the Trobian Islands, but read up and imagine yourself an outsider who can see it from, from there, because then you can relate, you can compare, and you can uh, uh, understand not only what's spe special about the place, but also how, what they, people, these people have in common. You know, the, I mean, one of the great founders of European anthropology, uh, Bronislaw Malinowski, who was also an immigrant. You know, he made his, he was Polish. He made his career in Britain. And he wrote uh, about the, the Trobian Islanders uh, throughout his life. But he wrote about all sorts of issues. And one of his main points in his early work on economic anthropology was to show that the Trobian Islanders are neither more nor less rational than you and me in their economics. They reason in the same way. Uh, if you just uh, look closely enough, you'll discover your neighbor in the Trobian Islands and yourself. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, um, so I started with sort of a, your, your, your life story you're touching in, in this essay and the toolbox you're discussing. And I'm ending with the conclusion um, of the whole book, actually, when in which we arrive at the heart of a scholarly battlefield, battlefield it seems, um, where the key ethical tension of sorts is the one between acceptable ways of knowing and acting on knowledge. Mm -hmm. It is as if the academic and applied labels were polar opposites, mm -hmm. as if understanding was always at odds with changing. And I mean, I have to admit, as a convener of Applied Anthropology Network, this question and this, this tension, which we are trying to quell and to really dissolve, um, and over the years, um, it's still being brought up and uh, being discussed. So what is your position on this acceptable ways of acting? Yes, yeah. yes. yes. Uh, the, well, we could start with the relationship between applied and basic research, or fundamental research, where... I mean, one of my mentors, Frederick Barth, once said that, you know, the main difference between applied and basic research is that the basic research is so much more applicable, which is not fair. But what he meant was that if it's really good, you can use it for anything. Mm -hmm. But it's not fair because in, in applied research, you find a lot of interesting theoretical insights. So it's, it's it, you know, so in a sense, the, the, the dichotomy is, uh, is artificial. And secondly, people who do applied research, at least they have a focus and they have a direction. 
and they have a goal for what they're doing. Whereas a lot of the basic research is just, you know, meandering and basically messing around with no proper conclusion. And, uh, uh, and well, the conclusion is just that everything is extremely complex, which doesn't help you. <laughs> so I, 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 don't, I don't buy into this. You know, I think this, uh, this distinction, I know it's, it's still out there. And clearly there's a distinction between people who work in academic anthropology and people who work outside of academia because they're in different uh, positions regarding work and they have different, uh, different job descriptions and so on. But when it comes to the kind of knowledge we produce, I find that it's, uh, it's, it's quite similar. You know, I've been working at university all my life, but I've always collaborated with people outside on various projects. I'm now collaborating on a sort of post-COVID project in Oslo regarding the greening of the city. Perhaps we could use this as a way to, to make the world a slightly greener place, more sustainable and so on. And it's intellectually incredibly rewarding. So, um, so I, I understand that the, uh, uh, the debate is there, but maybe the debate is more about, you know, what kind of job you've got, what kind of profession, and what the possibilities and, and uh, constraints uh, that offers uh, uh, contains, rather than the actual intellectual difference, which I think is less deep than uh, many people tend to believe. Mm. Thank you for this very much. Um, in conclusion, um, what would be the recommendation uh, on how to read the book, how to engage with the book as a, as a whole uh, for, for the potential readers? Yeah, that's a good that's a good question, Paul. You probably, as as one of the editors, you're probably in a better position than me to to answer it. But I would say that uh, what it shows is that everybody needs a drop of anthropology in their lives. You don't have to take a degree. You don't even have to take a university course. But anthropology can be a way of a lens through which we can see the world and see it in a slightly different way from what we would otherwise. Because it takes us out of a lot of habitual thinking. Because we always compare and we look for paradoxes and we um, are aware all the time that things could have been a bit different. We can look at it this way or we can look at it that way. So anthropology can be incredibly stimulating for your imagination, both your intellectual, your personal and your political imagination. I think that would be, for me, the message from the book. Thank you. I mean, uh, listening to you, it's always so refreshing and I hope I'm not the only one who feels this way or watching this interview. Uh, Thomas, uh, I'd like to thank you uh, for your uh, answers and um, I'm looking very much forward to perhaps your participation in Prague next year when we do a real 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 uh, physical book launch let's let's see yes. how this goes thank you so very much. do I yeah so do I thank you Pavel and I hope to see you in Prague too <laughs>